Hello, and welcome to the Nonprofit Leaders Network podcast. Interim Executive Director Ken Goldstein will be sharing with us today about nonprofit and board management, especially as it relates to being an interim ED. Before we jump into the podcast, have you ever wondered why some people do better at relating to people than others? A big part of this comes from understanding how people communicate. If you can learn this, you'll often see better results from your interactions with board members, donors, volunteers, and your family too, for that matter. If you're interested in learning more about how a personal communications assessment can help you, visit nonprofitleadersnetwork.com slash DISC, D-I-S-E-S-N, communications. Welcome to the Nonprofit Leaders Network podcast, where your host, Kirsten Bullock, interviews nonprofit CEOs and executive directors who share what's working. Show notes can be found at nonprofitleadersnetwork.com. Please add the podcast to your favorite RSS feed or iTunes. Now, let's get on with the show. Hi, Ken. Thanks so much for joining me today. Thank you. Good. Glad to be here. Ken Goldstein has been working in nonprofits and local government agencies since 1989. He's currently executive director of Recovery San Jose, in addition to running a consulting practice that serves nonprofits. He's served half a dozen organizations as an interim executive director, has managed nonprofits through transitions, mergers, turnarounds, and I'm sure a lot of other types of situations. He's served many years in senior management roles, including executive director of Sustainable San Mateo County, Silicon Valley director of Compass Point Nonprofit Services, and Bay Area director of for Benevolent, just to name a few. He's also served on the boards of directors of Future Families and Habitat for Humanity, Santa Cruz County. Thanks so much again, Ken, for joining us. You can read his full bio on the podcast page at nonprofitleadersnetwork.com. Ken, could you go ahead and share a few words about your background with those mergers, acquisitions, turnarounds? It sounds like quite an adventure. Uh, yeah, listening to that introduction, it's like, oh, holy cow, it's, it has been a trip, hasn't it? And, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, so, so, you know, from the introduction, you know, you said, you know, I've been involved in, in, uh, nonprofit arena and such since about 1989 and mm, nearly half of that in, in the consulting, uh, field. Um, and so within that consulting, I've done about a half dozen interim executive director stints. And so those were going into organizations, going through uh, some kind of transition. Uh, why they would bring in an, an interim is exactly that, you know, a, a questionable future perhaps, or looking at a merger or some other reason why an organization doesn't feel ready to fill that, that ED chair on a permanent level. And so several of those um, have, have become uh, mergers. And I would say, let's see, um, I've probably, let's, let's say, gone through merger negotiations three times, which led to two mergers. So you can see, you know, not mm-hmm. every time you enter into merger negotiations, it doesn't guarantee that you're actually going to uh, marry those two organizations together. Um, you know, which, and, and, and interesting, you know, I, I chose the word marry, but, you know, when you, when you do this, it, it really is, um, you know, it, it frequently referred to as a courtship, that there is uh, a getting to know you period. There is a, a period of, you know, it, it, you know, kind of dating around before you tie the knot. And it's a very important period. You don't um, just marry someone on first sight and you don't merge on first sight. And that's mm-hmm. kind of, you know, where, where uh, my experience, uh, you know, has led me to yeah, to accept that that metaphor. You know, the first time I heard that metaphor, I thought, "Oh, that's ridiculous." But the more I've done it, the more I've been around it. It's like you know, it's it's actually a very apt metaphor. The the dating and uh, uh, you know, it, and and getting married aspect of, of uh, going through a merger. So you mentioned that two of those completed and the third yeah. didn't. Right. What were the what were the circumstances around that where it just didn't work out? Yeah, you know, it, it, and this is where where that 
you know, expressing your feelings and, and dating you know, where, where, where it pays off um, because you do need to get to know the organization. You do need to be able to, to trust the other organization implicitly and, um, and make sure that what you each want is the same thing. Uh, in, in the case of that merger that didn't work out, um, you know, it was – what what the organization which I was intermediate of, what we had put on the table as our top priorities from the start, what we expected to get out of the deal, um, was given lip service to, and 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 there were things which happened at the very end, which which made it clear that they were not serious about that. They simply wanted. Uh, they, they, they wanted us for our body, uh, which in that case meant real estate, the, the organization, which I was mm-hmm. in we, we owned a building, and it's like that's really all they wanted. Uh, so they, they and and, um, and they, they, they their commitment to the rest of, of what we had put as concerns um, clearly was not um given the heed to and 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 this was a, a, a negotiation which went on for a long time we 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 were talking for about 11 months you know, having meetings and, and thinking we were getting somewhere then not and then starting again and we should have gotten the hint a lot earlier than we did but we we when things got started again we thought okay yes this is working and we were to the point of having uh, all the legal documents drawn up. We were to the point of where, where the final corrections we were making on everything was like, you know, an added comma here and there. We were to the very nitpicky and ready to sign documents. Um, wow. when they made a one-sided decision that, that eliminated one of the items which we were most interested in. Um, yeah, <laughs> it's what we wanted to get out of them. They eliminated from the organization uh, unilaterally the day before we were supposed to sign the final deal, uh, which was quite a quite a blow. Because when you're, you know, in, in this interim and in, in negotiating situation, you know, the 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 danger of taking too long. You know, I, I, I you know, previously I just said, you know, you do want to take your time because you do want to make sure everything's right and make sure you know, you trust and know everything, and you're not just rushing into it. But at the same time. There are things which, while you're in negotiations, may not be happening. Your funders are probably aware of what's going on, or should be, and they may, you know, may be reticent in renewing grants if they're not sure what the future of the organization is going to be. And so, you know, you may you may be falling slightly behind in that regard. And so, when you have to then pick it up uh, and say, okay, this is not going to be a merger. It's, it's um, you know, you're you're mm-hmm. you're starting from a behind position, and that's what the rest of that uh, interim assignment ended up being about. It was okay. Now, do we do we pick up? Do we find another potential partner and pick up the pieces and go from there, or do we regroup, rebuild, and uh, hire a permanent DD and and re 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 question whether a merger was the best idea in in the following years? And that's what we ended up doing. Was then. Then my focus as interim was uh, building the funding base back up, making sure, reassuring funders that we could survive and would survive on our own, and that uh, you know, build, re- regaining any ground that had been lost, as well as then recruiting uh, a, a new permanent ED who could um, who, who, who could lead that organization and, and grow it as if we had never thought we were going to merge. <laughs> uh, and, 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 and that was very successful and turned out to be the best thing for the organization, for the uh, for that community, et cetera. So, I mean, things worked out as they should have. It just took a certain amount of time to get there. Um, mm-hmm. But that's part of the, that's part of the learning that 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 goes on is. Um, you know, is <laughs> sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. And sometimes it not mm-hmm. working out is the best thing that you can hope for. Absolutely. Yeah. So how was staff morale during that time? Was that difficult for them? Yeah, that's something which, which any time you're an interim, you know, you, you have to be, be very careful of whether, you know, obviously during mergers, staff are nervous about whether positions will be eliminated. Uh, but but even even when it's not necessarily a merger, um, 
people see someone new coming in and they need to be reassured, uh, you know, of what's, what's going on. And so keeping communication channels open and, and, you know, sharing as much information as you can, uh, as, as frequently as you can is, uh, for, for anyone who's doing any kind of, um, uh, consulting, you know, that's going deep into an organization, making sure staff knows um, whether they're, you know, they're in danger or not, mm-hmm. and keeping them appraised of, of of negotiations is crucial because you don't want the people because the, the 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 danger is. The, the real, the real and true danger is that if there are any staff, if you do think that you're going to be trimming staff at all, the problem is the best people, the people who you'll want to keep, will be the ones who are the most hireable, and will be the ones who, if you don't communicate, they're going to be they're they're, they're going to take they're going to be offered better jobs and they're going to accept them. And that's the people you want to keep and the people you're going to be stuck with are the ones who you were thinking of. Maybe that's <laughs> the fat you can trim. I mean, that that's the irony is, is if you don't communicate honestly and you, and you leave it and you make people worry, you're going to lose your best people, not your, not your expendable people. Um, so, you know, in any kind of leadership situation, always remember that, mm-hmm. uh, you know, keep communication open. Uh, you know, and, 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 and keep your best people as part of the the, the uh, solution seeking team, and not as a second thought, not as you know a group that's um, that's led to believe they're expendable. You know, mm-hmm. they they will they will in a good economy they will find even in a fair economy they will find jobs where they where people do care for them and do treat them with respect. That's a very good point. Yeah. And I would imagine that philosophy of over communicating and and being in touch with people is very applicable with the board as well. Did you oh, find yeah. that to be true? Definitely, definitely. You have to, you know, and that's something which which as a as a uh, re- repeating interim, <laughs> you <laughs> you do rely on being able to. Um, to get people's trust uh, quickly, yeah. So yes, I was talking about staff a moment ago. You bring up board, but it also goes for for donors. It goes for you know any stakeholder for for their clients, of course. Um, you know, for for any stakeholder in the organization, that kind of um, being being approachable. Um, Greeting people with a smile and not let, no matter how stressful it is, don't don't let that show on your face when you're meeting people, or they'll take that as oh my god, everything's going going to heck, you know. We, you know, you, you don't want to set up alarms just because you're under stress. So you know, you you wear that smile and you you respect people and you listen to their questions, and that goes for yes, all stakeholders, staff, board. Clients, funders, et cetera. Uh, you know, well, the local uh, elected officials who you have dealings with, or, you know, anybody, everybody. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So let me ask you a question then. If you're not showing stress, where, as an interim and somebody who's in that situation, where is a safe place to show that stress so you can at least release it? <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, yeah. hopefully if you're an interim, you know, well, hopefully if you're any kind of ED, interim or permanent, you have a, you'll have a good relationship with the board chair because that's the most important relationship in any organization is the ED and the board chair. And so hopefully that's someplace you can, you know, kind of shut the door, let down your hair and be honest with each other and, mm-hmm. and get through it together. Because if you're not getting through it together, if you're, if you're, if you're, in a position where where you you feel you can't be open and honest with the board chair, you're you're in a dysfunctional organization, and and things are only going to get worse. <laughs> uh, yeah, it, that that ED board chair relationship, whether whether interim or permanent, is is vital to uh, to keeping any organization on a, on a sound track and moving forward. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So knowing, and, and, you know, I mean, there can be other allies as well with whom, you know, you can, you know, get into that. Well, you know, uh, yeah, it's been stressful, but, you know, still work towards, you know, getting towards that, that happier moment. But, uh, certainly when, when you're, when you're meeting people, you, know, you don't want, you don't want that to, uh, you don't want that worry or concern to overpower, so, uh, any new relationship, any, any greetings. <laughs> right. 
Yeah. And a lot of times, I know we learn, we tend to learn more from our mistakes than we do from the things that we just naturally do well. Um, oh, sure. Would Is there a time that you can think of where maybe things didn't go right, you didn't quite approach things oh. the right way, and looking back, you know that you would do something different? Would you mind sharing about an instance like that? Yeah, you know, there, there's particularly as an as an interim, you know, there's, you have to choose your priorities based on what your what you feel is, is, you have time for, and sometimes that means letting certain things or items that are that you you know are you going to leave that for the next person or or not, and and some and that can be a, that's always a challenge because if you're an interim and, and frequently an interim is not hired to be, you know, quote, 40 hours a week, which everyone knows is really, you know, 60 hours a week for the executive director. But in interim, as a consultant, you might be working two or three days a week at the organization. So there's some things you have to let slide and and you you, you second guess yourself for the rest of your life about, oh boy, I wonder if I could have done that. But, you know, so it's not necessarily any one thing I could I could say as an answer. It's more like, it's everything. <laughs> you know, it's, it's everything mm-hmm. which, uh, which you, you had to say, okay, that has to, that can't be a front burner right now. That has to be something that can, that can wait for later. And then, and then you go back and say, oh gosh, maybe, maybe we could have done that. Maybe we did have time. Um, you know, maybe I should have taken that on sooner or, or something like that. Um, so, yeah, I, I mean, I, 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 I'd rather not you know, spend the next three hours going through specific <laughs> instances <laughs> or just that general kind of you have to prioritize and then and then you second guess yourself for the for the rest of eternity. Mm-hmm. And that's normal. That's that's okay because because it's that thinking about it and wondering what you could have done different. That there's the learning and what you bring to the next to the next assignment. Right. And I think you bring up the great point, too, that we can't always do everything that's in front of us. Yeah. Yeah. And I know Especially with the resources director, of small nonprofits. Yeah. Right. Right. And I see people and executive directors that I'm working with who are just burning the candle at both ends, trying to get everything done. But mm. it sounds like you're saying that there are times when not everything can get done. So choosing priorities. Right, and and you know it's interesting you say you know other executive directors because it's true. It's like I'm I'm saying that in the context of being an interim who's only supposed to be going in three days a week to take care of this the most high level administrative keep the organization you know running kind of tasks. But even when you're the quote really the forty hours plus a week, if it's a small you know low budget community based grassroots organization, most likely you're the executive director, you're the development director, you're the finance director, you're the personnel director, you know, et cetera, et cetera. You're doing, you're wearing four or five hats. Um, and, and, you know, you're, you're not going to be the absolute best at any of them. If you, you know, if you had the funds to hire someone just to do personnel, you would. But, but if you don't, mm-hmm. you just do the best you can and get advice where you can. And, um, yeah, and and you know, and, and know that there's going to be more to learn, and things that might slip through the cracks. It's just it's just a fact of life in, in a you know, in, in that you know, unless you have millions of dollars to grow an organization, if you're a typical small organization in that you know, five hundred, seven hundred, fifty thousand dollar annual budget, there's going to be things that are going to that are going to be missed. Mm-hmm. So are there any tools that you've used to help decide which ones to do and which ones not to do? Boy, you, you, well, <laughs> like I said, you, you know, the, yes, yes. The, the the tool is your board chair. Again, you know, that, that's an important relationship because if you are prioritizing things and you're not discussing it with with uh, the, 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 the leadership of the board and put maybe, you know, leadership of, you know, some staff leaders as well, um, you you may be getting your the priorities wrong. You have to you have to consult those others uh, to find out historically, especially if you're new to the organization either as a permanent ED or going in temporarily as an interim. Um, you, you can't make these decisions in a vacuum. You have to know what the 
what the history has been and what has gone on with these things beforehand. You got to find out what have what historically have been the priorities and where uh, where people's loyalties lie in regards to that. Something that you think, oh, this is just a small thing; it's no big deal. But it turns out that that's that's where everybody else's heart is. You're going to be in trouble. <laughs> you know, even you know, mm-hmm. you have to get so you know. Yeah, the tool is using the the people who are there. Um, you know, yeah, yeah. That that's the most important tool you have. Mm-hmm. And the recurring theme that I hear you talk about is communication. Communicate, mm-hmm. communicate, communicate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Def- definitely. Uh, yeah, you, it, it's it's not. It's not a solo sport. It's, it is a t- you know, <laughs> you know, nonprofit management is a team sport. You know, I think I think any kind of proper business management is a team sport. I you know I I, mm-hmm. I don't know you know anyone who says they they can they're doing it all themselves and they don't need any help is probably a little bit delusional. <laughs> yeah. Great. Well, Ken, thank you so much for this. It's always amazing how time flies quickly by, but. In closing, oh, yeah. do you have any um, advice or words of wisdom that you could share with people who are new to this field, entering a nonprofit leadership role for the first time? Yeah, just just you know, talk to everybody you can. You're doing the right thing, You're taking some time out to listen to this podcast. You know, read blogs from various nonprofit leaders. Go to conferences. Um, it, you know, it doesn't matter. You look at the agenda and you say, well, none of these workshops are. It's like, it doesn't matter. You go to conferences, not just for what's on the official agenda and program. You go to conferences to meet people, to network, to to so if there's somebody you know. With them. For me, a lot of times at conferences. The best things are in those coffee breaks between sessions where you talk to somebody. It's like, oh, I had a problem like that. What did you do? Oh, this is what, you know, and it's that kind of sharing where that, that that's phenomenal. So, um, yeah, I mean, that, I, I think that that's one of the best pieces of advice is don't don't take it all on yourself. Don't don't think that you, you know, have to uh, be perfect from day one and and that um, no one's there to help you. Other nonprofit leaders love to help, you know, new people to the field. Uh, that that's one thing great about what we do is that people are here because they because they care because they give a darn, um, and and that extends to welcoming new people to the field. It's not it's not a cutthroat. I'm not sharing my <laughs> secrets with you. <laughs> you know, it's not that kind of environment. So you know, take advantage of people's openness. Um, you know, whatever meetings, conferences, etc., you can get in on. Um, you know, and 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 keep learning. I, you know, I, I've, been, I've been in this field for over a quarter century plus, uh, and and you know, and yes, I do consulting and I help teach others, but I still learn every day myself. I still go to conferences and meetings and such to to see what I can learn. And it doesn't matter if it looks like the agenda is, oh, I could do that workshop, or oh, I could teach that workshop. I don't care. I still go to the conference and I meet people and I talk and I learn. It's it's a lifelong process. Great. Well, thank you, Ken. And thank you to our listeners for everything you do to make the world a better place. Thanks for listening to the Nonprofit Leaders Network podcast with Kirsten Bullock. If you like what you just heard, we hope you'll check out our prior episodes and that you'll pass along our web address, nonprofitleadersnetwork.com, to your friends and colleagues in the nonprofit sector.